Hey, so I want to carry us a little further in our discussion of um, being in from Chapter 5 of uh, Division 1 of Being in Time. Um, you know, we were talking last time. I'm just going to read you a few sentences uh, just to make sure you're in touch with the book. Starting on page 169, which is the first page of the chapter. Uh, just to remind you what we talked about, he, he said, um, what we're doing is we're, we're studying the... Uh, um, uh, uh, primordial structure of Dasein's being, uh, and and he says about uh, ten lines down that we're, we're our view is taking we're taking this with the view of it being a, what he calls a structural whole, uh, and so I just want to remind you there that the, the point was that uh, being in the world is is the is the you know the whole happening of experience, and it's not like there's one thing over here and then another thing over here you know a subject and a world and somehow this one goes out and finds that or somehow this one comes along and forces itself in, right? Rather, there is an activity of experiencing, and it's within that activity of experiencing that we, we come to differentiate the, the, the world, or you know, in what you might call sort of the object pole. Like we come to say of our experience, oh, it's about X. And we come to say of that very same experience, it's the experience by me or of me in the sense of possessing so it's of the object in the sense of what it's about it's of me in the sense of the one who possesses it but you don't start off with a separate uh having an existence of the world and a separate having an existence of a self and somehow uniting them the reality is experience is happening and it's within that that we come to distinguish those two uh the the two sort of ways that experience points us um, and so we're going to talk about, so we talk about sort of the object side of it, or we talk about kind of the subject side of it. But but in each case, we're still talking about just the, uh, it's a way of talking about that experiential whole. Um, anyway, so, um, and actually that thing I was just saying about it not being one thing coming up in, in contact with another that it's separated from, he talks about that uh, at the bottom of page 170 fairly clearly, I think. So, so that the paragraph... Um, that begins on page 170 is it's worth reading just for his attempt to try to say to you like don't split this thing up into separate pieces there's just a single happening of experience anyway on 169 at the end of the second paragraph he says the primordial being of Dasein is care and that's what we've been talking about and now I want to just uh, go to a little bit on page 171 and remind you that um, it, I quote this some time ago, uh, but he says in the third line, the entity which is essentially constituted by being in the world is itself in every case it's there. Okay, so that's another way of saying that point I was just making about not separating them. Right? There's nothing else to you except the experiencing of this. But you can't go somewhere else and find yourself. You just are the the one for whom experience is happening this specific experience is happening and you aren't something other than what is appearing to you like there's no there's no other piece of you to find right um and so uh in that sense you are you're there and i tried to make that point earlier by looking at that um velasquez painting las meninas and at the very beginning looking at that uh, manet painting uh about the folie bergere um but um Another another way of saying that to to pick up on what I was saying last time about lived space and the card game and so on, is that because our being is in habitation, we're not a separate mind who is uh, looking out at an alien world and making conscious representations. It's not that we inhabit a situation, and because of that, our very identities can't can't really be separated from those specific worlds that we inhabit. So, you know, you can say there's a card game going on there. Uh, and another way of saying that is that in, in that situation, I am a card player. And that means my very, my very way of existing is to enact myself through the cards and the table and the peanuts and the kitchen and all the other things that make that up, right? Um, and so I am my there in the sense that the very sense of who I am is just the flip side of the very sense of what that situation is. And notice, uh, when I'm um, the father prepared, well, I guess I could stick with the women in that picture. When I'm the wife and mother uh, making dinner for my family, that's not the same who 
that I am when I'm the third person in the card game, you know, or if it's if they're playing bridge, you know, the one of the one of the members of one of the partners, one of the pairs. Um, uh, so the mother uh, deals with that table too as the place for setting out the food for the evening's dinner with the children and her husband. The card player deals with that table as the place where they take tricks and so on with those other women. So even though to the to the person taking a photographic objective view of things, they would say it's the same table. Experientially, it's not. Right, The table for the mother serving dinner is not the same as the table for the card player playing cards. right? And indeed, I mean, uh, maybe that pink... Um, let's, let me just look at that picture again for a second. Um, maybe that, uh, that pink uh, elephant or whatever it is up on the shelf... I mean, it's it's unlikely in this picture, but but let's just say, you know, maybe it's a kid's toy, and so maybe when this woman, I guess it probably wouldn't be your daughter, when her granddaughter comes over, maybe she gets that toy, right? So that toy isn't even isn't part of the room or the region, the space in which she plays cards, but that toy is uh, part of the world in which she entertains her grandchildren, right? Um, so. Um, the uh, so um the uh the point there is then that uh the table is disclosed to her a different way or the the room is disclosed to her a different way or the pink elephant is disclosed to her a different way when she's being a mom and when she's being um card player a grandmother when she's being a card mother uh, card player um in a, so the, the the point again then is that those those very identities are ways of inhabiting. And so to live that identity is to live that space in a certain way. It's to live those things in a certain way, right? And so that's that's a part then of what it means to say Dasein is it's there. Um, uh, now I want to read a little bit more. Um, the next paragraph after that. So I read the started the par the first part of the paragraph that begins on 171. Let's look at the beginning or the next paragraph. Um, he says, um, uh, he talks about the natural light. Descartes and, and probably others talk about a natural light, and that's the lumen uh, naturale. And um, it doesn't matter what he says there, but he's he's sort of saying like like sometimes people say you, you know you turn on the light and that's how you understand things and your experience is illuminated. So he's just picking up on that. That's not particularly important. But but uh, he says to say that uh, it the there is illuminated means that as being in the world it is cleared in itself, not through any other entity, but in such a way that it is itself the clearing. Um, it's going to say something like that again on page 187. I just wanted to pick that up on uh, for a second, right? Um, uh, what reality is is kind of cleared for you in a certain way. It, it's like you know, imagine there was darkness. Like imagine you, you know, uh, everything were just alien. It didn't mean anything to you. Well, when you take up our ex your existence as a card player, suddenly, well, I don't know if "suddenly" is the right word, but but the the world is kind of disclosed to you in a certain way. It's uncovered. It's brought out of sort of hiddenness to to be illuminated from you. To, uh, and so that's kind of what our experience is. It's it's inhabiting a kind of clearing. It's inhabiting a way of seeing, a way in which the world is disclosed. Um, and so that's what he so he says. Dasein is its disclosedness. That's at the end of that paragraph. Um, and and so the, uh, that's really then, uh, I hope you've understood what I've said, it. and if you have, then you can see that that's really just another way of saying this entity is its there. Right? There is a uh, how the world appears and how you are or who you are are two ways of talking about the same happening of experience understood in the sense of inhabitation as opposed to understood in the sense of conscious representations. Um, uh, yeah, so I just want to remind you of that, to, to partially take you through that text and to remind you of some of the things we were talking about. So now I want to, I want to now we want to look at these modes of disclosedness, modes of care that he's going to talk about. And I want to just take you back to a couple of pictures and look at this one, for example. Um, this is a Jeff Wall picture. Uh, 
called Retrospective from 2007. Um, <clears throat> and I want you to think about, imagine this as a portrayal of a kind of experience, you know, uh, and you think of yourself as that guy and, and how that world functions for him. Um, now, you know, we don't see what that world is like at other times, but it says no smoking. Uh, there's a sink there with a coffee pot and stuff. So, you know, it could be the staff room at a place, but it could also be, you know, a room at some local place. Like, I don't know, what, what do you call it? The VFW, the, the Veterans Hall uh, or whatever. Um, it could be a place where people go to play cards or something. Imagine, imagine the card players are there. Imagining, or maybe it's a place where there was a dance. Who knows? But, but try to imagine what it's like for people to inhabit that situation when it's in action. Contrast it and contrast that with how this guy's inhabiting his situation. Um, I don't know it for sure, but probably he's bored <clears throat> and it's just work. It's just kind of drudgery. Here I go. Like it's probably the, maybe it's the last room I have to mop. I'm almost done. Or maybe it's the first room he has to mop. And he thinks, oh, am I ever going to get done this and get on to the other ones? Who knows? Um, but, you know, if you look over by the radiator, do you see the stuffed animals on that on that uh, pipe, the sort of pole? You know, if, if somebody cares about the stuffed animals, it's not him. You know, if they play a part in the life of the the daytime life of this room. They don't play a part in his life, kind of like that pink elephant in the card player uh, picture. Um, and you know, when, when he's sort of bored, uh, the, the one, one way that you could think about how that room is disclosed is it doesn't, it doesn't invite him to do anything. You know, when, when people are in there uh, I don't know, let's say it's a card tournament or let's say they're having a dance or whatever it is. You know, a bunch of people there, they're kind of excited. Like some people are are sitting over there and, and a guy comes in and sees his friend and he eagerly goes over and sits in one of those chairs, which would probably be in a different position, to talk to his friend. And in that case, he experiences the chair. Like, I don't know if you've ever been in that spot where maybe there's someone you want to talk to and... Maybe it's someone you're trying to get to know, someone new, or, or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's someone you know, but that you're kind of a little bit afraid of, like maybe it's a teacher or your boss or something, who knows, but, but it's a person that, that you sort of charged. That chair can seem very inviting and very exciting. And you think I'd, I want to sit in that chair, but to do it is, uh, to, to have the possibilities of conversation with that person open up, but it also is a kind of a daring move for you to go sit in it, you know? And so the way you experience the chair at that situation in that situation is as this um the chair is really charged with excitement and a little bit of threat and it feels it feels like an aperture a, a doorway an opening it feels like an a, not an opening into another room an opening into another interpersonal reality like if you can sit in that chair it's gonna let you get into a relationship with this person you know um or, uh, uh, I don't know, If I, let's say it's kids playing there, you know, maybe that picture the, on the wall, the wallpaper, the birds and stuff, maybe that becomes part of a setting for an imaginative game. I don't know, but they could be excited to say, oh, look at that great painting. Oh, yeah, I wish I was there. Let's pretend, let's pretend we're hunting bad guys over there and they're hiding behind those trees, you know. You could imagine children responding in something like that way. Um, the thing to notice is, None of those things are speaking to him, this guy here with the mop in that way, right? In his, in, in his involvement in that situation, his mood presumably is something like boredom. It could be something else, but it, it, that's kind of what it looks like to me. And, and if you think, what does boredom mean? It doesn't just mean that, you know, going back to this talk about consciousness, you know, uh, it doesn't just mean that there's a content of consciousness, like there's a certain feeling inside you or something like that. Uh, experientially, in our lived experience, a mood is the way our space is cleared for us or, or, or disclosed for us. It's the way our situation offers itself to us. And uh, whereas when you're working in the carpentry shop, you know, the tool is ready for you and waiting to help you put the nail in when you have to put something up on the wall or something. And so it's like charged and, uh, and uh, 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 
sort of ready to jump in, like, almost like a companion. Here in this state of boredom, none of these things is inviting. They're they're all just kind of dead, right? So so the uh, the chair the chair isn't an aperture to an exciting interpersonal world that that is experienced with excitement and threat and whatever else. The chair, if he notices it all, if he notices it at all, is just an obstacle to his uh, mop. You know, and and in fact, if you've ever been in that kind of situation where you're the the janitor or whatever, um, I, I wonder if you've had this experience. I certainly have. That that I actually notice that this is a room that other people use, and and it really kind of stands out to me that it's meaningless to me, and it feels kind of kind of kind of dead and depressing, precisely because uh, it doesn't it's not for me and it doesn't engage me. So maybe even more than boredom, maybe there's something a little bit depressing here. And and that's so that's even a step more than saying that the chair isn't inviting him. It's more like the chair is almost kind of repelling him. It's like saying, yeah, I'm for someone else. I'm for people who really have a life. But you, you just bounce off the surface of things. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is I'm, I'm trying to give you a sense of um, the disclosure of the situation in terms of mood and, and how mood isn't just a feeling mood is a very sense of the meaning of things um, but le let's take another picture I'm going to come back to this one in a minute because I want to say something else but let's take another one another Jeff Wall I like Jeff Wall especially for this kind of stuff for for uh, communicating how a situation has a mood um, here this one's called the goat from 1989 uh, I don't know why it's called the goat, whether it's the greatest of all time or whether it's somebody getting your goat or whether it's someone acting like a goat. I don't know. Maybe you know something about that idiom that I don't. But anyway, this doesn't look like a very nice scene. It looks like the the bigger kid who... It looks like he's not exactly white uh, is being threatened by these other guys. Uh, maybe the, the two guys on the... Left look like they were white kids. The other two guys could could uh, could be a lot of things, but in any case, so it, it's hard to tell. Is it racially motivated? Or, I don't know, but it doesn't look nice. It looks like these other these four guys have got the one guy surrounded, and the guy at the front who's crouched over is kind of mocking him, and trying to draw him into a fight or something like that. You know, whatever you can look at the situation and figure it out, but think what it's like to be there. You could think about that for any of those people. And indeed, it's actually, it's interesting. Let, let, uh, well, I'll say another thing first. First of all, think about it from the point of view of the guy who looks like he's being targeted. Um, uh, um, uh, there, um, you think, what would it be like for him? You know, and uh, it could be kind of scary. It could be kind of threatening. Actually, I mean, it's, it's even hard to tell because if you look at the, the guy right beside him with the blue shirt and the way his foot is in front of him, it could even be that those two guys are being targeted. Maybe they're brothers and maybe they're uh, Hispanic or something. And the other three guys are white and they're targeting him. So maybe the one guy, the kid in the blue is looking at the guy with the stick and the bigger kid is looking at the guy who's crouched down. I'm not exactly sure who's targeting whom. But let's just imagine you're you're the kid who's presumably being called out, uh, and you think, what would that situation be like? Probably kind of kind of scary, maybe not, maybe you're not scared, but but I bet it would be a little bit electric. And in and you think, what's he going to notice? Like he's going to feel his body in a certain way. He's going to notice the kid who's looking at him, and and the situation he's in is basically one for fighting, right? And and one for grappling with feelings of humiliation, threat, pain, you know, the sorts of things that are going to come up there. And like, I didn't want this to happen. I thought that kid liked me or, you know, who knows. Um, uh, so so I want you to think about how differently charged this is and how that's, that scene is disclosed in a different way. Um, uh, other things could have happened there, like maybe... You know, maybe it is the case that the the bigger kid and the kid in the blue and in the blue shirt and the black sweatpants, maybe they are brothers or friends. And maybe, you know, five minutes ago, they were just playing. So maybe they were having a good time and think, what was that situation like when they were playing compared to what it's like now when these other kids have come up to harass them? Um, and let me go back to the other one for a second. 
because I want to go on with this comparison thing. So imagine what would happen here if suddenly, unexpected to this guy, a door opened and uh, his best friend from high school suddenly walked into the room. And maybe, you know, maybe that guy had found out where he worked and he came to find him. You know, imagine that sudden moment of uh, change. And this guy looks up and his mood is going to be so different. He's going to go from being bored or, or sort of a little bit kind of depressed and wrapped up in uh, thoughts about the mop. And it's just producing a kind of moderately meditative state where he's mostly meditating on how wasted his life is or something like that. And so the guy comes into the room and suddenly our mopper is translated, or, uh, transported out of that situation into one where he's like, hey, buddy, you know, and he he probably uh, uh, lets go of the broom with one hand and moves it into the other hand so that the one hand that comes out can wave or can reach out to shake his friend's hand or or maybe he quickly walks over and puts the mop against the wall and then comes over and gives his friend a hug. Um, and his mood is going to be so different, right? His mood is going to be... Um, surprised and sort of energetic and a little bit joyful and um, where he was walking around in silence before he's suddenly going to speak and where the room a minute ago only made sense in terms of uh, a mass of floor to be mopped and he was thinking about uh, how dirty the water was in the mop pail and when he was going to have to change it and where he was going to have to change it and so on suddenly the wall becomes a place to lean the, the mop. And the mop is now no longer really a piece of equipment. It's something that's kind of in the way of what he's trying to do. So he's gonna put it off to the side. And after he hugs his friend, like maybe they, he says, pull up a chair and they pull up a chair and, and uh, maybe he walks over and gets a drink of water or maybe he's got a bottle of beer over there or maybe there's coffee in that coffee pot. He says, let me get you a cup of coffee. And they get, they get together and they start doing things, right? So think about that change and how, um, a set of things change all at once, right? The overall meaning of the situation changes. Um, and that, and it changes as a reflection of th this guy's care, what matters to him. And in that change, his mood changes. And with that, the possibilities of the room are disclosed differently, right? So with that change in mood, it's like a new understanding of the room appears as well and in that new understanding it's it's opportunities to fulfill a different kind of project show up right so you know so going back to the other one the the uh, the goat like you know I was saying like imagine what the situation was like a minute ago before the nasty kids came and what it's like now and that the, uh, how there a new mood brings with it or is a disclosure of that situation in a certain way and the the way it discloses it is a revelation of what the possibilities are that are available in things which means in par part also which things are relevant and which things aren't and and those possibilities are the ones that uh, are pertinent to what that person is now going to try to do or, or what what matters to that person right um yeah so so those are good pictures and anyway just to uh um just to keep thinking about um yeah uh, so um uh, so you know you can just you can just look at them to keep trying trying to use I, I wanted to use them because i think that you can they help to just show what it's like to inhabit a situation which which is as uh heidegger says back on uh 171 how we how dasein is it's there in an everyday manner like those are everyday situations and they show something about how you are you're there they show something about how who you are um is wrapped up with where you are not where you are on a on an indifferent geographical grid but where you are in the in in the sense of the sense of your situation and that the that situation which is how the world is disclosed to you the disclosure that your identity is is cashed out in terms of a kind of mood apprehending it 
a, a sort of a striking you in a certain immediate way uh, and where again mood is not so much an inner subjective feeling is it as it is the way you're attuned to the sense of the world that's a heidegger's uh heidegger t uh, emphasizes the word stimmung for mood which also means attunement and so he's saying it's the way you're attuned to the world uh, not at the level of a thinking conceptual thing but at the level of an immediate feeling so it's how how the world feels does it feel like exciting and inviting does it feel uninteresting and dull uh etc etc um uh and so i want to try to bring that idea out and i wanted to try to bring out the idea that um that disclosure of the world in mood goes hand in hand with a with a kind of understanding which is to say there is a sense to what can be done in the situation and and thus what these things are and how they work so so those two things together the mood and the understanding are kind of a seeing as they're the, they're what you see the situation as in a very broad sense of see i think i used exactly that same language a few lectures ago um and heidegger says that in here like you can we could we could talk about design sight um uh in in the very broad sense of like how this thing to use this language you just used how the language is uh, the situation is disclosed to you or how how it's cleared for you but that, but that sight that way of seeing that seeing as is has this double sense of the immediate way the sense of it strikes you in the in the way that you're gripped and attuned to the situation which is mood and in the understanding of the situation in terms of its possibilities in terms of your possibilities right H how it it lets you be you what it offers to you right um and then the, and then uh the last thing is again uh, i said this already with the card players but i want you to think of it again with both the um uh, the, the the janitor guy in retrospective and the kids in goat the goat um uh, those situations of mood and understanding are also situations of giving voice. So if for the janitor, um, uh, someone comes in, his friend comes in, he's going to start talking to him. Like that's part of how you live the situation is by experiencing its sense for you as something that is to be shared with others. And so that, that, by comparison underlines something about his lonely experience as the janitor like part of the meaning of that is that there's no one to speak to right and that's not um that's kind of a positive characterization of it in other words that's that's actually a salient part of its meaning like where normally there would be people there's no one for me to communicate with the, the absence of someone with whom to share the experience is actually a, a, a kind of a salient feature of its meaning um, and and that also you know nonetheless articulating is going to go on but the guy's going to be saying words in his head he's going to be telling him a sto himself a story as he's going on about what he's doing and about whatever else he's thinking about and so on um, so I want you to think about that way too right that in these situations like living the sense goes hand in hand with giving voice to the sense either to others or in the absence of others you know to yourself Similarly, in that situation with the um, the goat, you know, there is there's going to be giving voice like, you know, come on, guy, and uh, I'm not scared of you or show us how tough you are. You know, just, Get out of here or whatever. Like, there's, there's going to be giving voice in that sense. But also, interestingly, because that is, I think, a, a antagonistic and confrontational situation, that's, those people are going to have experience a little bit like the janitor, too, I think, right, in that uh, they're there's probably going to be a kind of unanswered inner monologue or inner uh, speaking that precisely doesn't find in the people around him, those are all hymns, the people around them, I guess, uh, a, a, a one who can be spoken to. So that, so that situation, there's going to be giving voice, but there's also going to be experiencing the inability to give voice too. Um, so okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just wrap it up there and then come back and look at the text about these things. But what I wanted to do then is in the first lecture was 
is to introduce this idea of lived space from chapter three and then try to bring that out into the sense of inhabiting a situation and some of the dimensions of that. And then here I wanted to thematize more specifically mood, understanding, and then this last thing, articulation or giving voice. Um, I want just to, th to thematize how those dimensions are, are the ways our caring, our encountering, our connecting are always being carried out. Um, so we'll come back and we'll look at, look at the actual text of um, chapter five of division one where he talks about those things and in going through the text specific, uh, uh, in its details, uh, we will learn uh, a little bit more about some of those things too.